What we are going to do today is talk about electrolytic cells. If you look at electrochemistry, there are two parts. The first part is electrochemical cells and the second one is electrolytic cells. Now if you compare them, you'll find that in electrochemical cells, a chemical reaction produces electrical energy and that was a spontaneous reaction. Now if you look at the electrolytic cells, the opposite is true. We use electrical energy to bring about a chemical reaction. That's what we're going to study here. There are a few terms that we need to be talking about. One of them most commonly used is electrolysis. You may have studied electrolysis in lower classes where you tried to separate hydrogen and oxygen from water by using electrical energy in the Hoffman apparatus. So if you use electrical energy, a form of energy, you can bring about a chemical reaction to a very stable compound. One of the most common processes of electrolysis involves ionic compounds that are melted through which we pass electrical current. We can split them up and this chemical reaction is usually called electrolysis. And for performing this chemical reaction, the device that is commonly used is called an electrolytic cell or an electrolysis cell. Since this reaction does not take place, since this reaction does not take place by itself, or we have to force the chemical reaction to take place by using energy, which is electrical energy, this reaction is not a spontaneous reaction. Therefore, the delta G will be positive. Or we can say it's a non-spontaneous reaction. You can calculate the value of delta G or you can calculate the value of E0 cell or standard cell potential. You'll find it's positive. It has a positive value which tells you that the reaction is not spontaneous. So we are talking about a non-spontaneous reaction and we are trying to bring about a chemical change by forcing it to undergo the chemical reaction. And in order to do that, we use energy and it is electrical energy. Two types of electrolysis that we are mainly focusing here. One is electrolysis of molten ionic compounds. If you electrolyze a molten ionic compound, all the time the products obtained are determined by the positive and negative ions or the metal and non-metal that is present in it. So in this non-spontaneous reaction, we are going to use energy and we are going to use two metal rods connected to a power source and the electrode that is connected to the positive terminal is called the anode. And the reaction that will take place at the anode is oxidation. And usually the non-metal is produced there. A negative ion changes into a non-metal in the elemental state. The electrode that is connected to the negative terminal of the battery is called the cathode and the reaction that takes place there is called reduction and metals are produced at the cathode. The positive metal gains an electron and changes into a metal ion. As you have already learned, oxidation is loss of electrons and reduction is gain of electrons. So at the cathode there is reduction because the metal ions gain electron and changes into a neutral atom. Here we're going to look at a typical example, electrolysis of molten sodium chloride. The reaction that takes place at the cathode, as I already stated, is reduction. In molten sodium chloride, you have Na positive ions and Cl negative ions. At the cathode, which is negatively charged, sodium ions are attracted towards it, takes an electron and reduces to sodium atom, zero charge. 
this is reduction. At the anode, as we already stated, it's oxidation. The chloride ions give up their electrons to the positive electrode and change into chlorine gas. If you add the two half reactions, you will see two electrons are gained by the reduction reaction and two electrons are produced by the oxidation half reaction. Add them up, you get the net cell reaction. So you're taking a stable compound and changing them back into elements. Elements, you, most of these elements do not remain as elements in the natural state, so you know why we call this reaction as a non-spontaneous reaction. The next, we're going to look at electrolysis of an aqueous solution of an ionic compound. Now here, when you have water as a component, now you have a positive ion coming from the ionic compound, a negative ion, and there is a third substance that is water. So when there are three substances in an electrolytic cell, sometimes water com competes for oxidation or reduction with the metal ions that are present in it. Therefore, the products that are given off may not be the ones that we expect. And we can actually make a prediction based on the standard production potential values. We're going to look at the electrolysis of aqueous solution of sodium chloride to get an understanding. And in order to do that, we need to know what happens to water if it undergoes oxidation or reduction. Reduction of water. Reduction is gain of electrons. So two moles of water can gain two moles of electrons to produce hydrogen gas at two moles of hydroxide ions. And the standard reduction potential value for this is minus 0 0.83 volt. So in water, you have, in an aqueous solution, you have water and the metal ion. There is competition for reduction between these two. That's what we're trying to say. Now, in comparison to the two water molecules and the metal ions, always the more reactive metal will not be reduced. So let's say if you're taking sodium as an example, sodium ions you already know, or sodium metal you already know, can react with water to form hydrogen. You can also look at it in that sense. So if a highly reactive metal is part of the metal ion, when it undergoes reduction, it changes into an atomic element, which is very reactive with water. So you find that highly reactive metals will not be produced by electrolysis of aqueous solutions. In such cases, water will undergo reduction than the metal. Therefore, it produces hydrogen gas at the electrode. So water has a greater tendency to be reduced in such cases. On the contrary, if water has a lower reduction potential value than the metal, then the metal will be reduced. So usually, uh, less reactive metals tend to be reduced at the cathode, and the more reactive metals will not be reduced. Therefore, water will be reduced at those points or at those electrodes. Now, if water is to undergo oxidation, this is the reaction that would take place. Water on oxidation produces oxygen and four hydrogen, hydrogen ions plus four electrons. Oxidation is loss of electrons and the value for the standard reduction potential would be 1.23 volts. So if water has a higher reduction potential than the anion present in the solution, then water will be oxidized in comparison to the other anion that is present and oxygen will be the byproduct that you will get at the anode. If you have aqueous solution of NaCl, this would be the chemical reaction that's going to take place. Sodium, highly reactive, therefore if it's produced, it's going to react with water as you already know. Therefore water is going to be reduced at the cathode. Cathode is equal to reduction and water will be reduced. You can look up the standard reduction potential values to make a comparison. At the anode, oxidation is going to take place and chlorine or the chloride ions will be oxidized. It produces chlorine gas and two electrons. 
So every time you're talking about electrolysis, you should be looking to differentiate between the products obtained when molten electrolytes undergo electrolysis and aqueous solutions undergo electrolysis. The next important aspect would be if you have potassium nitrate dissolved in water, these are totally spectator ions, neither potassium nor nitrate will be undergoing reduction or oxidation. But you will find that water undergoes oxidation at the anode and water undergoes reduction at the cathode, which means it's going to produce oxygen at the anode and hydrogen at the cathode. So if you get a question related to electrolysis of potassium nitrate or similar compounds, you may want to be very cautious in terms of writing the oxidation half reaction and reduction half reaction because neither of these ions will undergo oxidation or reduction. Now, as you already know, if oxidation of water takes place, it's going to increase the hydrogen ion concentration. And if water is undergoing reduction, it produces hydroxide ions, which means the electrodes will be surrounded by hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. So if you add a few drops of indicator into this solution that is being electrolyzed, you'll find there's a distinct color change indicating an acidic solution and a basic solution around the electrodes. And the role of potassium nitrate is typically to maintain, to maintain an electrical neutrality for the solution. An increased hydrogen ions can be neutralized by the negative ions from the potassium nitrate and the increased negative charge coming from the production of hydroxide ions are neutralized by the presence of potassium ions surrounding it. That maintains the electrical neutrality of the solution. So that's the important aspect. So the role of potassium nitrate is to augment the process of oxidation and reduction of water because of the difference in the standard reduction potential values for these ions in solution. That's it for now. So look up the examples for electrolysis of molten ionic compounds, aqueous ionic compounds, and ionic compounds that help in the oxidation and reduction of water by itself. Those are the three cases you may want to look up and you should be able to write um, the half reactions for the anode and the cathode and write the net cell reaction and that is an expectation and you would also find that the E0 cell or the standard cell potential for these electrochemical cells will all be negative because they are non-spontaneous reaction and delta G for these cells will be positive. Those are the thermodynamic aspects of electrolytic cells. That's it for now. Hope this lesson helped you understand the concept of electrolysis. Right.